and uh, okay, I think we should start now. And uh, it's uh, a great pleasure to have uh, Professor uh, Zhang Yongjia from Stony Brook and uh, join us, uh, give a hit seminar today. And uh, uh, Jia Yong, I think, is, is, is well known, uh, of course, among uh, the uh, physicists in the Heavyang community, and in particular in our lab. And uh, I don't think he needs much introduction, but just uh, for formality, let me just give a brief introduction. And he got his PhD uh, in 2003 from Stony Brook. And after that, he um, uh, was a postdoc at Columbia uh, from 2003 to 2006. And then I think he joined uh, uh, both Brookhaven and, and Stony Brook in 2006. And then he became uh, a full professor, uh, I think, I'm, I'm sorry, 2006 or 2000, I forgot. I, it's not updated yet on your, on your CV. <laughs> I joined the 2006 and 2000, uh, yeah, I, I'm become a full professor in 2017, maybe? 17, yeah. 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 Okay, so, and, and Jia Yong is going to talk uh, about imaging nuclear structure in heavy collisions today. And this is the uh, uh, latest work he has been doing. Uh, Jia Yong, just take away from Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Xin Yang, for the invitation. And uh, yeah, it's very, I uh, would like to visit uh, Berkeley, uh, but at least I can do a virtual visit and uh, see, see people here. <clears throat> so, so I want to basically um, try to explore um, the potential of uh, uh, study the initial state, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, of the Hamian collision, in particular, uh, the nuclear structure using the, using the uh, you know, our, uh, uh, much improved the understanding of the heavy ion dynamics. I want to establish the connection between the nuclear structure and the heavy ion collisions uh, using the, for example, the flow observables. So uh, here's a, some of you have see, have heard this uh, seminar, uh, or at least most of the material has been presented uh, multiple times. Uh, but I will just go through them uh, and uh, and uh, in in, still in a lot of details. Um, so. Uh, you know, we have this uh, standard picture of the Hamian collision, uh, where the initial state have a lot of fluctuations, and uh, you know you can characterize the the, the participant region uh, using the you know uh, by the size, right, and also the shape. Uh, this is the the root mean square size and the eccentricity of the overlap region, and they fluctuate a lot event to event. And we know this uh, fluctuation are imprint in the final state uh, flow, uh, uh, you know, basically the, in the momentum space uh, in terms of the radio flow, uh, which are really related to the size fluctuation, right? There's a, it's inversely related. Um, and also the harmonic flow, which is proportional to the eccentricity, at least for the V2 and V3. And we have seen a lot of experimental evidences on this and uh, the, the lot of theoretical work and comparison with uh, experimental data at RIC and LHC uh, that established this uh, very simple relationship. At least on average, there's this linear response relation between the size fluctuation and the, and the mean PD fluctuation and the eccentricity fluctuation and the, the flow fluctuation. And so, uh, of course, this is not a really, uh, well, well let, let me just then point out that if we actually understand this relationship uh, uh, very well, uh, we can go one step further and then uh, go back to the, uh, the colliding object and ask, uh, what's the relationship between the uh, initial state and the nuclear structure, right? So here, uh, when I talk about nuclear structure, it's really a, a semi-classical uh, picture where you just treat you know, the nucleons as a wood saxon, uh, follow a wood saxon distribution uh, with the, the half, uh, uh, Half, uh, half uh, the density radius, right, R0, and uh, the surface diffuseness, and also the deformation parameters, like, for example, quadrupole deformation, octopole deformation, uh, hexadecapole deformation, right? So this is the uh, shape variables. And basically, <clears throat> you know, 
the nuclear distribution is a, look like it's a classical picture and nuclear structure is a classical picture. And then we just then uh, form this uh, simple geometrical picture and then using the final state, uh, uh, you know, the flow and the hydro to relate, to basically unfold the flow back into the initial uh, shape and size information, which then are connected to the uh, nuclear structure, right? So this is a really a semi-classical picture and a classical picture. But of course, uh, uh, the reason we can do that is because the crossing time uh, in the heavy collision at high energy is very short. Right, it's uh, 10 to the minus 24 second. And so all the nucleons are frozen uh, in space. And of course the size and the shape of the nucleons may be different, may depends on the uh, beam energy, but uh, you can treat them as basically uh, sort of like a froze, uh, frozen during the crossing. And, and this may be, uh, it's not very clear or exactly clear how this uh, nuclear structure at this very high energy uh, actually related to the nuclear structure people calculate or measure at the low energy nuclear uh, uh, nuclear um, experiment, which is typically, you know, the time scale is like 10 to the minus, 20, uh, minus 21 seconds, right? It's a factor of 1,000 longer. Um, so, so maybe, uh, for example, the nuclear fluctuation at, you know, at a much longer time scale, you probably are not sensitive, right? Because you, you, you actually measure this collective wave function of the nucleus, so that's a, I think it's a, a one aspect that uh, that uh, will be interesting to investigate. But nevertheless, uh, using this uh, uh, classical picture, uh, we can try to ask, uh, try to uh, basically uh, establish this relationship, right? So, from nuclear structure side, we have the size, uh, diffuseness, and the deformation, and the, from the heavy ion side, we have the the, the size and the, the eccentricity of the overlap region. Okay, and uh, so so if you look the um, uh, the nuclear structure uh, starting from wood saxon uh, geometry, we can ask uh, what is the shape of the nuclei, and the shape uh, basically is controlled by the surface uh, uh, shape of the the surface, and uh, you if you do a a simple um, expansion of the shape right in terms of the spherical harmonics. What you have is that you have this uh, 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 quadruple deformation, octopole deformation, and uh, hexadecopole deformation. And so this beta parameter controls the overall deformation, but then there's also internal angular variables that, uh, that changes the, the shape of the surface, right? And for example, the, the gamma parameter, <clears throat> what it does is that it adjusts the relationship between the three uh, radius of the, of the of the ellipsoid, right? So, so uh, fixing beta two doesn't really, really constrain the relationship between the uh, between this radius, and you need another parameter to fix that. Okay, and so uh, if uh, gamma equal to zero, this gamma basically is this angle here uh, from goes from zero to sixty degree. Uh, so prolate uh, uh, will be gamma equal to zero. So where a equal to b less than c. Oblate will be A less than B equal to C, which is uh, corresponding to 60 degree. So you can see uh, this is called the uh, triaxial deformation. And so this is actually something that uh, was not investigated a lot in the past in heavy ion collisions. Um, so in the nuclear structure, the way they determine the shape uh, of the nucleus is uh, uh, nuclei is that uh, they write down, for example, uh, the Hamiltonian of the multinuclear system and they try to minimize the energy. Um, and the energy is a function of this beta two and the gamma, for example, and you calculate the uh, potential energy surface and you find the local minimum. And the local minimum will tell you the, the most preferred sh the shape uh, for this uh, nucleus, right? And you can see, of course, it's not fixed value, but it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of like a, it's a, it's a surface with the local minimum. And right? so is, that could be a fluctuation of the shape in this case. Now, um, the, in addition to the shape, there's also radial structure. Uh, so in other words, uh, you know, if you, uh, you, you plot the uh, project the radial distribution, and you will see that the nucleons, and particularly the, just the neutron the protons, they, can, they may not look like wood saxon at, at all, right? They could have uh, uh, some uh, um, wave-like structure in the in, in a radius, 
And uh, so this reflect the quantum uh, nature of the, you know, the nucleons in the, in the nucleus, in the, nu in the nucleus. And so this, uh, this structure, the shape, right? This uh, also depends uh, strongly uh, along, uh, you know, the, the, the ratio of the neutron and the, and the, and the, and the proton. So, and, and so the radius, for example, in, in the low energy measurement, the charge radius, for example, have a non-trivial evolution around the, the as function of, uh, you know, isotopic train. And you can see around the magic number, you know, you could have some non-monotonic change of the radius. And also the radius of neutron and proton are the same. So you can, this difference is called the neutron spin, which also have a, have a very uh, interesting uh, dependence on the, on the, uh, on the, on the asymmetry between neutron and proton. And the, the, the measurement is precise enough. Uh, you know, people starting to ask the, the question about the, what is the high radial moments of this uh, proton neutron distribution. So there's uh, it's theoretical work on going on this, along this direction, okay? Uh, you know, the, the, the questions people ask in nuclear structure, there's a lot of questions. I mean, I, I don't really know the physics there. So I only read some review articles. And, and so they have a lot, uh, you know, many, many physics that, that they want to learn. Uh, and so the, 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 the examples are given here, right? So people want to know how the, the shape and the size and neutron spin evolves along the isotopic chain, right? So because if you understand this, you actually can really constrain the nuclear structure model. And right? this is a very important direction people work on, right? And so people also want to measure um, the high order deformation, especially the octopod deformation, because the evidence for octopod deformation has been observed. And this is, uh, they want to understand whether the deformation is a static deformation or this is a purely an octopod uh, you know, correlations. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's a vibration mode. Um, there's a, also try to people um, try to determine the tracheality. And the uh, experimental information on this actually is uh, very complicated. It's, it's very hard to measure this precisely because the, uh, uh, I would say the potential energy surface is quite shallow, right? So it's, it's not easy to determine this. From both theoretical side and experimental side, it's very difficult uh, to, to determine this. Um, and there's also another complication is that you could have multiple uh, minimum in the potential energy surface so that means that you could have a, you know, sort of like coexistence, right? The, so it's like entangled system, you, you, the, this nucleus can, uh, can take any of this uh, combination of the, you know, of the shape in this, uh, uh, in this example where you have two local minimum. Um, but of course in Havian collision, the, the tool we use is very different. If we image the shape using this uh, flu, and we probably don't really, you know, uh, I mean, the, the sensitivity, the level of sensitivity we have is, is probably is different. And we want to ask whether, you know, we can help uh, in, this, uh, in these areas. Um, in the past, there was already quite a lot of effort to, to actually, uh, the idea is not new. I think I'd say it's like uh, using heavy collision to study the nuclear structure, especially the shape. Um, it's not new, it's, uh, you know, it's like 20 years uh, or, or even longer. Uh, but the, the strong experimental evidence uh, on the deformation really comes after a uh, star have the uranium collision, okay? And you can compare the uranium and with gold collisions. What you see is that um, in the flow of observables, there's really very dramatic difference uh, between gold and, uh, gold and the, uh, uranium. Um, so there's a very large enhancement of the V2, for example, the variance of the V2 or two particle V2 in the ultra central collisions. And so the, the V2 fluctuation, like the four particle uh, you know, cumulants of the V2 have a very large difference, right? Between gold and uranium. Now, if you also look at the, the PT fluctuation, right? Event by event, the PT fluctuation in the variance of the PD fluctuation or skewness of the PD fluctuation, you can see there's a very large difference between the uh, gold and the uranium, right? So the difference could be in the central collision for the skewness case is you can reach like factor of 10 difference, right? This is, there's even indication of uh, an increase of the skewness uh, towards central collision. 
And this difference actually is not only limited in the central collision, but it's, you know, you can see it's there for even in the mid central collision, right? So, so this uh, influence of the deformation actually is quite large. And another observable is this uh, recently people proposed to use the V2PT correlation. This is a three particle correlation. And, uh, and the deformation, basically what it does is that it suppresses the, the signal uh, relative to the spherical system. And you can see the difference is very dramatic between the two, between the uranium and the gold. So of course, it's nice to see this, right? But we want to understand how these signatures are related to the deformation, right? Before we can actually use, turn this into a quantitative tool. Um, so the relationship actually turns out to be quite simple because it's all geometry driven. So let me use this simple cartoon to uh, establish this connection. So let's only consider a liquid drop, right? This, uh, which have a sharp surface, it's a very simple picture. And uh, you have this uh, uh, a prolate deformed uranium. And so you have kind of a body-body collision, right? In the central collision, head-on, body-body, or tip-tip, or something in between, right? And what you can immediately see is that in the transverse plane, when you calculate the eccentricity, uh, this eccentricity and the deformation is directly, is, is directly proportional to each other. And the, the coefficient, it, it is controlled by the orientation, right? It's controlled by the, 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 the Euler angle uh, of this uh, colliding object, okay? So, so in other words, relation is very simple, but you need to take into account the random orientation. Of the of this uh, uh, nuclei, okay, and so so what this means is that uh, if the deformation, if the beta is very small, uh, to linear order, you can just uh, do a Taylor expansion, and you will see that eccentricity contains a undeformed piece, right, which uh, which is do dominated by the nucleon fluctuation in the ultra central collision, and also in peripheral collision is dominated by the impact parameter, uh, plus a term which depends on the deformation. And so this coefficient is controlled by the Euler angle. And, you, and so plus high order terms, okay? So this relation is true, should be true on an event by event basis. Um, the, the gamma, which is a triaxiality should only appear here. It doesn't appear in the undeformed sphere, uh, right? It should appear here because if the beta equal to zero, it doesn't matter what the uh, gamma value you put in. So, Due to the symmetry, it should always come like three gamma, six gamma, and blah, yeah, and like this. Okay. Now, if you look at the size fluctuation, um, because the size we're talking about the, the is is the second moments. Um, if you talk about the second moments, this is naturally related to uh, quadruple deformation, right? But it, but in general, you can do the similar expansion like this. Okay. Um, so now uh, when we do a two particle correlation means you, you calculate the variance of the event by event flow, uh, eccentricity fluctuation, then naturally um, the dependence become a quadratic on the beta. Okay, the same is also true for the, for, the, for the size. And so what I then do the next is that just argue that, you know, uh, this relationship, right? The quadratic dependence I established here, but this, uh, this, uh, if the if the nuclear structure, uh, it, it, also the radius and, and the diffuseness, if you change it by a little bit, right? If you have some reference value, you vary it by a small amount, then of course you can the linear order contribution should be a linear function, right? So what I want to argue is that in the realistic case of what we are dealing with in heavy collision, uh, uh, you know, if you compare two other bars. Uh, this uh, simple uh, formula, pocket formula actually works pretty well, okay? So then you can simplify uh, the relationship between the, you know, the, the structure and the initial state, okay? And then we go from the eccentricity to the flow um, using this, uh, you know, sim uh, linear response. We can, at least can, as a first argument, you know, simple argument, we can, we can use this. So I, I carried out some uh, global model simulation, uh, very simple calculation, and uh, to, to, to explore this relationship, what I do is that I calculate the eccentricity, right? Second epsilon two square. This is the second order eccentricity, two particle. 
And so I start from a spherical system. I increase the beta two value, right? To some large value and take the ratio from the spherical case. You can see as you increase the beta two, there's a huge enhancement on the, on the epsilon two, right? Expected. Um, but if you increase the beta three, the epsilon two also increases, but only it only happens in the mid central and the near central region. But in the ultra central collision, uh, beta three actually does not uh, influence the epsilon two, right? But in mid central, it does. So I have this relation here. Now, if I um, test on the epsilon three, I change the beta two, you can see epsilon three is not affected. Okay, um, but um, it does depend strongly on the, on the beta three. So I have this second relation. Now, if I look the, the size, uh, the, well, this is the, the D, D perp, I didn't mention, this is a one over R, okay? It's an it's a estimator for mean PT. And this, the PT variances, uh, actually a very strong dependence on beta two, uh, smaller dependence on beta three, so this look like the look like epsilon two, right? So so it, it influence is very small in ultra central collision, but it could be sizable in mid central collisions. So then this give you the third equation, and I argue that this relationship survives to the final state. Uh, the only difference is that you need to the, the the numerical value for this coefficient will depends on the hydro response, but the analytical relation should be true in the case of if the deformation is small enough, okay? So this will actually give you a robust way of understanding the relation between the final state observables and the nuclear structure uh, or nuclear shape. Well, uh, can I just ask a question? Uh, th there is uh, some kind of uh, empirical yeah. connection between epsilon and V2. So, so in this case, but then what is, what is the D and delta D relate, related to delta P, that PT? Is there any empirical yeah. connection? Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, so, so basically, the what happens is radio flow, right? So radio flow is is following. When you have a source which is more compact but contains the same amount of energy, it have a larger radio flow than a source which have a larger size, right? So, so basically, the pressure gradients. So the D, you can think the D. Is, is this, like, I mean, is, is this one, established one. some, like uh, at least some due to, by some simulation? Yeah, yeah, so in the hydro simulation, so what happens is that um, the, it's, not a, it's not proportional, all right? So I don't know if I have a formula here, I don't. But in mm. the case, what I mean is that, um, but here you are assuming they're almost so, like proportional. No, no, like no, I don't. So I do not. I do not. So, so basically, I'm saying that uh, the mean PT is inversely related to one uh, uh, to the radius, right? So it's like related to one over r, right? Uh, but the, but the, it may not be linear. It may be polynomial, right? But the, the fluctuation. Once you do a fluctuation, right? And this fluctuation is proportional. You can show that, right? Imagine you take a you you have a you have a, a as long as long as the it's inversely proportional you do a you do a you do a derivative you calculate the variation of that normalized by itself like this is the like a you know dirt of log pt and that is proportional it is more more valid in okay uh, more. I yeah. believe you, but it's not that uh, well, some if you say, yeah if you think about it straightforward it's not very straightforward to understand. This has been shown in the hydro, but you can think about whether PT is, propor is proportional to one over R or one over R square, you will get the same relation here, right? That you can see very easily, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't depend on the power of that dependence. Okay. Right? Because it's, there's, you know, yeah. Because we're talking about the fluctuation, uh, not the actual uh, value. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, yeah. So, um, but the question, the next question is, how, how, uh, what is the observable that we can use to get the information on the triaxiality? Uh, um, so, so as I said, let me draw this uh, prolate, oblate, and triaxial nucleus. And this is the, with the beta two fixed, but all I do is I change the gamma, right? 
So the same beta two, but a different relationship between the, the three radii. And so what you can then immediately see is that when you have a collision of this, uh, the, the nucleus with this shape, you can have a body body and tip tip. Uh, if you have a prolate, um, then the body body have a large size, right? The size is large. The eccentricity is also large. And when you have a tip tip, then the size is small and the eccentricity is very small. So in other words, you have this positive covariance between eccentricity and R. And the opposite is true for, is all for the oblate, okay? So that's, there's a sign change. And so for, for pure triaxial, then there should be no linear co correlation between the eccentricity and size. And this is what, the, what we already know since like two years ago, three years ago, okay? But in addition to that, what is interesting is that the probability of having these kind of events like body body is much higher than the probability of having a tip tip, right? Because uh, I, I, when I combine RC, you, you can think about that you, ha you have three ways of combining the radius, right? You can combine this RC and RE, RC and RE, and RE and RE, right? So the probability of having RC and RE combination is actually much higher than the, the, the choice of uh, you know, combining the RA and RA. Uh, so, so the probability of having this event is much larger than probability of having these kind of events. And what this means is that you have a non-zero skewness on the size fluctuation. Okay, this is very easy to see. And this is the actual calculation using the liquid drop. And so for pure triaxial, it look like this, okay? You just think about this middle branch can merge either with left and or right to, to, to make the probability distribution uh, asymmetric. And so when you have a non-zero uh, skewness, and so since PT is related to one over R, you will see that the, 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 the mean PT skewness would also non become non-zero and also depends on the gamma angle. Okay, and it's a very simple picture here. But the sign is opposite from the V2PT, it's totally opposite. And so when we run a AMPT simulation, this is the AMPT simulation. Uh, so full, you know, uh, dynamics are implemented, but I put in the, uh, the, the triaxiality in the initial state. You can see that going from uh, prolate deformation, like a uranium, really prolate, all the way to oblate. In the, in the case of prolate, <clears throat> the we, we, we 2 pt correlation is negative as, as I showed you in the previous slide. But as you increase it to uh, uh, pro, uh, oblate, it actually changes sign. And, uh, and, and instead of decrease, it starts to increase in the central collision, okay? And the uh, recent uh, calculation uh, done by Giuliano and his nuclear structure colleagues uh, what they did is that they take the realistic uh, nuclear structure uh, uh, calculation as an input for, the, for, the, uh, for their global model, uh, actually it's a Trento model, and they show that uh, the, the V2PT correlation uh, in the xenon 129 at the LHC, this is very sensitive to the triaxiality and the, the value that Atlas measured for the V2PT correlation I actually prefer a, almost a pure, you know, uh, triaxial shape, okay? And for the xenon 29, this is very interesting. Now, I talked about the V2 PT estimator here, but you can see that if you run the pure global model calculation, very simple global model calculation, you can, you can reproduce a lot of this, right? You can see uh, prolate is negative, oblate is positive, and then you calculate the, uh, the, the, the skewness of the uh, PT estimator, and you can see uh, prolate is positive and uh, oblate is negative, right? The sign is opposite. You can clearly see this all doing. And if you do a simple um, uh, analysis on the, on the dependence, you can see this, this function actually describe um, um, this beta and gamma dependence very precisely. It actually works for all centrality somehow. Because my uh, initial estimation, this should be working the ultra single collision, but it actually works everywhere. 
um, you only need the three parameters, but of course, these three parameters is a function of centrality. And so if you look at the two particle correlation, which is the epsilon two square and the PT variance estimator, what you see is that if you change the gamma, uh, <clears throat> it doesn't change, right? In other words, <clears throat> In order, to, in order to be sensitive to the triaxiality, you need to measure the three axes, right? So that means you need to have at least a three particle, right? You need a three particle correlator to actually be, be sensitive to the triaxiality. If you only do two particle correlation, you will not see the triaxiality. And that's why you don't see a, a dependence on it. Um, this is actually quite good news because uh, we can use two particle correlation to constrain the beta two and then use the three particle or the skewness measurement uh, to constrain the gamma, okay? So this is my proposal. And uh, so I can show you a global uh, um, uh, expectation here. So, so I take the zero to one percent centrality, I run a global model, I parameterize the beta gamma dependence, I determine the coefficient. And what I can do is that I take this hill wheelers uh, coordinate, right, from nuclear structure, uh, and any trajectory, right, in this uh, in this nuclear structure uh, landscape, can be mapped to a corresponding uh, trajectory in the heavy ion, right? You can see how this triangle and um, this is mapped here. Um, all we need to do next is to de to to determine the hydrodynamic response to map to the final state observables. I think the the shape will preserve. Um, but the, the scale will change, right? Because of the, you know, the viscous damping. And so this is really tells you like, you know, a motivate a, 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 you know, a system scan, right? Because for um, in, the, in the structure community, you have, a, uh, you have a system for which the beta and the gamma is well known. And you can use that, those system to determine the calibrate the coefficient, right? All these coefficient can be calibrated. And then you can use that to make a prediction on the species for which it's very hard to determine on the beta, beta gamma values. And you can just uh, measure the flow by uh, the collision of those, uh, that system. Once you determine the flow, you just plug in the coefficient. You can make a you know, calculation in, on, the, on the beta and the gamma. So basically this is something that potentially can be done. Um, so you could also ask, what about high order correlations? Can we use a, a four particle, five particle, six particle correlation to do the same thing? Uh, the answer is uh, probably is yes. Um, so here I'm just using another model where I just use a very simple uh, liquid drop model, which is a hard sphere, uh, sorry, hard surface, right? So it's liquid drop. Um, and uh, in this case, you actually can calculate analytically what is the relation between eccentricity uh, and, uh, and the, the deformation, right? So it's only second order, beta two and gamma. Uh, so this uh, D is a weakener uh, rotation matrix and uh, which contains the, you know, the, the Euler angle here. Uh, but of course, I don't have a constant term because uh, this is a smooth geometry. There's no nuclear fluctuation. So the, the, the eccentricity without the deformation is equal to zero. So there's only beta two and gamma dependence. Uh, take this. I can do a very simple, quick calculation to estimate how this uh, uh, high order correlation expectation value should be. Uh, you can see how the gamma and the beta comes in. So three particle correlation, which I discussed earlier, always have a beta two cube dependence, but the four particle correlation, this is the epsilon two square and PT variance uh, correlation. This is a beta two to the fourth power. Um, and the, this is a PT, Kathosis, right? And you can see it's beta two to the fourth power. This is the V2, right? This is the epsilon two, sorry, epsilon two, uh, four particle cumulus, right? You also have this, and this is the six particle cumulus. And then I can cancel out the beta two dependence by normalizing with the lower order correlation. And this, this you can measure experimentally, okay? And this will oscillate the triaxiality. And with with a very robust uh, coefficient, uh, uh, you know, in the case of an infinite size system, and this will be precise. But of course, uh, in reality, um, this will not be like this. But but actually, not so bad. Um, 
uh, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, actually uh, predictions which I do not want to go to details because I want to spend the rest of my time to discuss uh, applications. How much time I have? Well, you still have like 20 minutes. Oh, okay, so that's good. I have, I, I have 14 yeah. slides. Oh, 25 mm -hmm. minutes. I mean, 20 or 15 minutes because it's now it's old. Yeah, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. Yeah. Okay. So um, let me go to the RSAPAR collection, the RIC RSAPAR, right? Um, this is a really unique tool. Uh, the reason is because uh, uh, in these collisions, uh, the machine actually deliver the beam with identical luminosity. And the experimental, uh, experimental uh, apparatus is actually running exact with the, exactly the same setup. And this really allow you to cancel all the systematics. And the measurement is unlimited by statistics, okay? So uh, what you could argue is that for any observable, right? This is not only limited to the flu observables, but uh, it can be jet quenching, can be non flu can be anything, CME, right? So if you measure this observable in this two uh, outer bar system, and if you take a ratio and you see the ratio is not equal to one, it must first come in from the nuclear structure, right? So the fact that you have different number of protons, different number of neutrons, all the shape is different, all the nu nu neutron skin is different, all of this. But of course, this difference originates from the nuclear structure, which then are reflected in, in the initial state and, and then survives to the final state, right? So if you understand the relationship, how they are, you know, are transferred to the final state, then you can use this observable to learn about the nuclear structure. And this should be true for any observable. And so there's many such bar system one could use in the nuclear chart, right? So there are stable pairs of bar. You can see these, uh, these pairs here. Um, if we can do that, maybe this is also, a we can turn around because if we know the nuclear structure very well, this can be a precision test on heavy ion physics. Right, um, so this is actually is a, will be quite interesting possibility. Um, let me go back to the also bar, right? So we have a ruthenium, ruthenium and zirconium, zirconium collisions. Uh, in this collision, as I said, you know, for any observables, I can do a Taylor expansion like this in the case of small, uh, uh, around some reference value. And then I take the ratio between the observables in the two system, I can, uh, the ratio should be a small, have a small departure from one due to nuclear structure. And the, it depends, you can already see that this deviation of the ratio from one only depends on the difference of the nuclear structure. It's not depends on the absolute value of the nuclear structure, but actually the difference, okay? And the difference between the ruthenium and zirconium uh, this this value are some of them are measured, some of them yeah more, uh, are calculated, so it's it's well controlled. Okay, this is four parameters. I I show you the default uh, you know expected difference between the between the beta two square beta three square surface diffusiveness and the radius. Okay, and I can then plug in and check whether this works. So this formula should work for most of the single and two particle observables and and like this. Okay. Um, so I want to first show that this, this uh, simple uh, uh, formula works well. So first I do is I, I use a global model. I dial, I vary the radius in a very big range, vary the diffuseness in this, uh, you know, large diffuse, large surface to almost zero surface, right? I also vary the beta two, beta three in some range. What I see is that if I take the ratio of the epsilon two, of course, it depends on the nuclear structure input and it's very strongly depends on that. The same is true for epsilon three and also for the charge particle multiplicity. But what is interesting is that if I scale them, okay, and, and, and scale them to the same value, you know, scale down to the same value, you can see the almost fall on top of the same curve, right? Uh, there are some deviations when the, when the departure is very large but more or less they, they, they fall on the same curve. So this really verifies this relationship, okay? And of course it's in the global model, but I actually can write, uh, you know, the, the dynamic model like AMPT. Um, I vary 
you know this by in some range in the in the r a beta two beta three, and I scale back, and I see that the actually when I scale to the actual difference expected difference between the ruthenium and zirconium, right to this value, you can see they fall on top of each other. So what do you pay attention to is the symbols, right? The black, red, and the blue. They all fall on top of each other in all cases. Um, and the global model uh, uh, scaled value is shown by this uh, pink line. And you can see for multiplicity, it works really well, but for um, uh, flow observables, there's some difference quantitatively, right? Um, and that means, yeah, that, that maybe the response is not trivial, but at least, it works, the scaling relation works, okay? So what this means is that uh, we just need to determine this coefficient for a given hydro model. Once you determine this coefficient and you can predict the ratio for any other parameter values, what this implies that you can apply a chi-square analysis, okay? And uh, run a set of parameters, uh, perform a chi-square analysis, you can determine some simultaneously this uh, coefficient, and this will simplify your model prediction. And uh, you can you can then use it once the parameter are fixed. You can use it to uh, to to uh, to make a prediction on uh, other systems, for example. I, I think this is something that is could be useful for future um, uh, future analysis. So uh, let me apply this to the R sub R data. So this plot shows you the ratio of the multiple uh, several observables, right? The ratio of the multiplicity distribution, V2, V3, and PT fluctuation between ruthenium and zirconium, okay? You already see that on the 10% level, you, that there's a difference at the 10% level, up to 10% level in the central collisions, maybe a little bit smaller in the mid-central and peripheral collisions, but the ratio clearly is not a one and it's not monotonic. And this already tells you, that, you know, you ask the question, you know, how this behavior, can this behavior be explained by expected knowledge of the nuclear structure, okay? So we perform a um, AMPT simulation again. So first of all, I show you the star data. This is the V2 ratio. This is the V3 ratio. So the V2 is larger in the ruthenium and V3 is smaller in the ruthenium compared to zirconium. What I do is that I put in, uh, let's say implement the beta two that is determined by the low energy experiment. I put in the beta two value only. I see I get enhancement on the, on the V2 uh, of the ratio because the ruthenium have a large beta two, zirconium has smaller beta two. Therefore there's an enhancement of the V2 relative to zirconium in the ruthenium. So the ratio is about one, so there's enhancement. But for V3, uh, there's no, de no dependence on beta two uh, as expected. Now, if I then put in the beta three, right? So the beta three of the zirconium is quite large. What this does is that it, uh, it uh, makes the ratio go below one because zirconium is in the denominator and, and the V3 is larger. Therefore, this goes, down, this goes lower. You see the V3 ratio now, uh, is very close to the data, uh, but the, but the, the beta three also influenced the V two in the mid central collisions, and but here also in sort of in the central collision, so the whole thing goes down a little bit, okay, and it misses data here, but then if I put in the the the, the diffuseness the A zero, you can see I can push up the data in this region in the mid central region, and getting closer to the data while uh, not changing the ratio of the of the V three. Then finally, if I put in the radius difference, uh, this is just a small adjustment, right? So you can see this may become a little, little bit better matching match to the data. So this already tells you uh, using different regions of this ratio, it have a different sensitivity to these different parameters, right? R a beta two beta three uh, in the in the Wood Saxon formula. Um, and so here's the multiplicity ratio, and this is a raw data from star. And then uh, if I only include the beta two, well, it really, you see a suppression in the ultra central collision due to the smearing uh, in the central collision, uh, but no influence in mid central collision. Now put in beta three, 
you see this only affects the ultracentral collisions. Now, if I put in the A0, right, you can see you already create this bump here. But finally, putting the R, you can see it matches the data. This bump match, uh, matches quite well with the, with the star data. So the tail is uh, more sensitive because there's a lot of cancellations. It's not easy to get it very precisely. Uh, we can also look at the PT fluctuation. This is the PT variance. Uh, by the way, I don't have a hydro model uh, calculation yet. So AMPT have the wrong PT response. So I only look at the global model. So global model, as I showed you, uh, beta two enhances the mean PT fluctuation and the beta three then decrease it a little bit, right? You can see in the global model, I can produce the trend, but not the quantitatively matching to the data. Um, People can also look the instead of variance, you can also look the mean value of the PT, and you can see how the different uh, parameters influence this mean PT ratio. Okay, which I will not discuss too much. So, what another application which is quite interesting is that uh, in the in the low energy community and nuclear structure community, there's a lot of uh, people are interested in the neutron scan. Okay, what is neutron scan? Neutron scan means if you take a wood Saxon geometry, the, the, the parameters, both the radius and the, the diffuseness are different for neutron and proton. If the neutron number and the proton number are the same, they are very close, they were almost the same. But if you have a neutron excess, of course the radius will become bigger and diffuseness will also be different. And so the difference between the root mean square radius difference between the neutron distribution and the proton distribution is called neutron scan. Uh, it can come in these two types. One is that as you add more neutrons, you just do not change the profile, you just increase the radius, okay? And the actual neutrons are being pushed out uniformly. The other is called so-called halo type, is that the actual neutron also shows up more in the, in the surface. And so you have larger a, a value for the diffuseness. Um, this actually is very sensitive to uh, the symmetry, uh, 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 equation state of the uh, symmetry energy in, in this term, this is called the slope parameter. And you can see the X is the, basically is the departure from the saturation energy. And saturation energy means 0 0.16, okay? And in the surface region, the difference between the density and the, and the saturation density, of course, is the maximum. This X value here is very large. So you can see L times X, this value is very sensitive to the, the neutron distribution on the surface. And so depending on the slope value, you may have more or less halo um, uh, neutrons. And this, is a, this information is of fundamental importance for, for neutron star studies, okay? Um, the people in low energy and nuclear structure measurement, they have actually determined this neutron scan. For example, in the heavy ion collisions, you have these uh, uh, other spin sensitive observables like a pion ratio, strangeness production. They are very sensitive to the neutrons, uh, proton ratio, right? So you can measure this, you can determine the neutron scan. Um, this is fundamentally different from what we are proposing, which is we do an imaging, okay? Imaging is not a, really not as a spin sensitive observer, but it's, it's, it's sensitive to the actual distribution, okay? So um, in the recent study, basically what you first simplification is that you, you just parameterize the distributions by wood Saxon, okay? It's a, it's a, first of all, let's, let's make this approximation. And then in the hydro calculation or the global and hydro calculation, you will see that uh, for example, the mean PT itself is directly sensitive to the radius, right? Because I said it's, it's related to one over the, uh, the radius. Therefore, you in the hydro calculation, you already see that different L value, this is the slope parameter you put in, lead to a different mean PT. In particular, the ratio between Ruslim and Zaconim are very sensitive to the slope parameter. And this sensitivity is not is not washed out by the final state effect. Like right? if you put in different shear with spark viscosity and shear viscosity, okay, the value change a little bit, right? Uh, but uh, they are still mostly survive. So, so this actually tells you, you, you mostly are sensitive to the initial state. 
what I before I finish, I want to really point out how do we visualize this relation more clearly. The, 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 the argument is really the following. Okay, let me just uh, skip it to, to, the, to this main punchline. Is that uh, in Hamian collisions, since I showed you, we can determine the dirt R, right, between the two species and the dirt A between the two species. This is for the nucleons. In the low energy nuclear structure experiment, they measure the charge radius very precisely, right? So, so from, the, from the charge radius measurement, you know the dirt R and dirt A for protons. Once you know the dirt R and dirt A for protons, you know the dirt R and dirt A for nucleons from heavy ion measurement. Combining this information allow you to directly calculate um, the, 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 the difference of the neutron scan between the two systems. So what you actually access in heavy ion collision is not a neutron scan itself, but it's the difference of the neutron scan between the two systems. And this formula, this is the pocket formula we derived. It actually works uh, pretty well. Uh, when you test some cases, it actually works well. So this is the this is the proposal. You know how we, we can use the flow measurement uh, to access the neutron scan. Okay. So now uh, let me go back. I talk about the energy scan, right? And 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 the, the, for the for the beta two and the, uh, gamma. But here's another aspect: is that um, the simpler uh, energy scan is only to try to determine the beta value. So um, just think about the example is the epsilon two, right? Or the V two and the beta two, you should have this simple uh, quadratic dependence, which are confirmed in the hydro simulation. And all you need to do is to determine the A and the B. And in the ultra central collision, let's say zero to 1% of centrality, we actually know in hydro simulation for large system, it's, it's just proportional to one over A, okay? It works really well. But suppose you don't know that you can still determine. So all you need to do is to run for two species and that will give you two equations, such equations, and you can determine A and B. Once A and B are determined, you can make predictions. And this should, probably should also work for the R and, and the diffusivity. Um, uh, you have additional terms here, which you can determine. So now uh, let me skip this uh, part. This is one interesting implication, which I don't have time to, to go through. Uh, so if we do an energy uh, like system scan, of course, there's infinite possibilities, right? Because we have so many, uh, uh, there's a, you know, uh, several hundred stable um, uh, isotopes, I think you know, 600 of them, um, plus an unstable one here, of course, it mostly is unstable ones. But the point is that the beta two have a non-trivial dependence on the neutron and the proton number. All right, so a lot of like deformation, uh, you know, um, non-trivial behaviors, interesting regions. The same is true also for beta three. You see the landscape for beta three, which is very little experimental measurement. Mostly this is theoretical predictions. And the radius also have this non-trivial evolution, which I showed to you under the neutron scan, right? So if you want to do a, a system scan, you cannot do all of them. You have to pick a few cases that is, you think is most useful, and this requires theoretical input, okay? And so in the past, in Hamilton collisions, we only collected uh, a few species at the Rick and LHC. We really didn't do a scan. And unfortunately, some of the colliding the species like the gold 197 and xenon 129, this is, this is not even even nuclei. So in other words, the ground state is not a zero plus, that means the spectra, the rotational span is very complicated and it's very hard to infer the shape information. And so what you really want to do is to collide the even, even nuclear, right? For which you actually have much more experimental and theoretical control. And there's a lot of such pairs. Um, and this is a, a partial list of the pairs. Um, what one could do, of course, is to select a few pairs which have an interesting nuclear structure uh, signature and a step through uh, a few different pairs. So in other words, you can cross calibrate the information across the, the landscape by selecting a few pairs. And uh, so of course, in the future, um, we really don't have much opportunity to do this at the RIG, although the RIG would be the perfect machine for this because they can collide anything on anything. Um, and this is not explored, 
uh, a lot, but we actually wrote something in the star beam use request where we said, okay, we only collide the gold 197. Why not at least collide the lead 208? Why lead 208? Because lead 208 has been uh, measured ex you know, exclusively at the Large Hadron Collider, right? I mean, if, if we collide the lead 208 also at the RIC, then we have the same initial state, uh, at least from nuclear structure side. This will be quite important for precision understanding of the initial state and pre-equilibrium dynamics, right? You can do energy scan of all the observables. At least you want to start with something that is the same, right? So this is important. But of course, since lead 208 is, is, a, is double magic and deformation is very small, you actually can use that to calibrate the deformation of the gold 197. What is probably also interesting is to put something that almost at the same mass as gold 197, like mercury 198. This, we know the beta two of this species, this can be used to cross check the consistency of the deformation, okay? Um, one can of course explore some other interesting regions and this, if there's a run in 2026, which is not in the table right now, um, if, we, if there's a run uh, before the EIC, this we can use, okay? Um, but looking in the future, what you want to do is that maybe beyond 2030, in the large hydron collider, the Hamian physics are not yet defined. Uh, we could do some species scan. Uh, this a table taken from the CERN yellow report where they actually mention accidentally, uh, there's a, you can see these are about pair, right? Uh, argon 40 and the calcium 40. Calcium, the calcium 40 is a double magic, okay? Quite interesting. Um, we can also look into other uh, heavy ion facilities like Nika, right? If energy is a little bit low, but you know, it may not, may be enough. You can produce several hundred particles in DND ETA, and maybe you can learn something. Uh, because also that the, the, another really interesting question is that nuclear structure, how the nuclear structure manifests itself. And maybe uh, it, it is energy and the rapidity dependent, right? So this may be interesting to do this in, at the NICA as well. Um, okay, so um, there's a very important question I think that need to be addressed by theoretical communities that, you know, we can determine the nuclear shape and the radio profile from hydrodynamic response. Is this the same or how different they are from the, what is measured in the nuclear structure, right? This is very important. Um, but of course, also, if we have much more precise understanding of the nuclear structure, can we use this information to improve our understanding of the initial state of the Hamian collision and try to extract the QGP transport properties, right? And so this is the question that uh, we try to address with some workshops. And so the, the one that I mentioned, which will happen in like two weeks, I, I encourage you uh, to register here. Uh, actually, it's a very interesting program. We, we have set it up. And the next one will be INT workshop in one year from now. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, we can invite you to come. So this is all, thank you. Oh, thank you, Ajayong, uh, for this very, very uh, nice talk. And uh, so we have a few minutes for creation and the comment from the audience, please. You can, you can just speak directly if you have any, or you can raise your hand, yeah. You didn't say anything about fair. I presume the energies are too low. Um, the fair, yeah, the fair energy is very low. So you know, um, I'm not. They are also interesting because what they have this. Um, uh, I mean, what I mean is, is that that the the uh, heavy ion experiment at those low energy has been done before, right? Right. You have a lot of data. The problem is that most of the particles are not produced, right? They are coming from the original colliding system. And the dynamics, the relationship between the collectivity and the initial geometry is entirely not clear because it's not, the system is not boost environment. I mean, the, the collision process uh, have a, 
it's it's very significant significant compared to the lifetime of the system. Maybe it more than its system spend more than fifty percent percent of the time uh, during the during the collision itself, right? So you have a lot of stopping physics. I mean, it's, it's more complicated, but I think people try to use that, for example, to study the other skin sensitive observer to extract the neutron skin. I mean, this has been done before. Okay, Und underscores the importance of trying to do it at, at RIC scale energies. Yeah, RIC, RIC or higher. Um, but, the, but of course, I, I mentioned also another aspect is that uh, the physics itself associated with the with the nuclear structure may be energy dependent. For example, if you have a saturation effect, right? If you have a saturation effect, you know your your initial state actually is modified from the global model in some non-trivial way, and how the deformation will enter that will also be different from lower lower energy. Uh, yeah. So so the energy itself dependent itself is I think is quite interesting. Cool. Yeah, I see. Uh, uh, so, Raj. Hi. Hi, Jenny. Yeah. yeah. Um, for the new neutron skin uh, uh, skin you know, thickness difference for, from the current isobar data, do you, mm -hmm. are you able to get any constraints? Yeah. Yeah. I think there was some work done by Purdue Group. Uh, we also published a paper on this. Um, you can see that very clear. So basically, as I said, you can only measure the dirt A and the dirt R, right? You measure the radius difference between the two R bar and the, the diffusion difference between the two R bar. And, and based, on the, based on multi observables, you have to look at all the observables to do a simultaneous constraint. You can determine the dirt R and dirt A. This is the dirt R and dirt A for, for nucleons. And you cannot get a neutron scan with only this information. You have to use another input, which is the charge distribution, that, which is well determined in the, mm -hmm. in the electron ion collisions. And combining these two, you can calculate the neutron scan difference. So this is, yeah, it is, you, have, you have to do some algebra. Yeah. Right, but uh, from the data, uh... Can any constraint be drawn? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can you can see um, you can see uh, there's one plot I showed you here. Uh, well, there's multiple, right? For example, here you can see without without the difference in the R and the A zero, you cannot. Oh, okay. uh, you, you, it requires a difference in the in the in the either the, in the A or the R in order to describe the flow in the mid central collision. All right, and also okay. the mean T fluctuation. You have you have many many observables you can use uh, to constrain this. Okay, but but from these plots, it seems like it's only the proton charge radius difference that's contributing. Right? No, no, no. no. Well, you can only determine the nucleons. Right, in Hamiyang collision, you, you only determine the nucleons. Right. Only determine the nucleon differences, but then you need another low energy input for the charge distribution. Then you can infer the nu neutron. Okay, no, but I thought, uh, yeah, okay. Right. Uh, I thought all these parameters are from the electron scattering data, just for the proton charge radius. Uh, right? here, in... here, what I put in here, in, in this, uh, in this is the nucleus. This is only for nucleons. But of course, you can then, uh, you can, this is the sum. This is the combined contribution of the neutrons and the protons, right? Mm -hmm. the, the nuclear structure model, let's see a uh, Hartrick Fock calculation. Um, and what they saw is that um, uh, the, there is a neutron skin, right? When in, in not equal to Z, there's always neutron skin. Mm -hmm. But of course, you can always calculate the, uh, the, the average. But what happens is that the fact that, the, for example, A0 for zirconium is bigger than ruthenium, this mainly because of the extra neutron. OK. All right. Uh, you, can, you can separate the contribution. OK, thanks.
Well, let me, uh, if I don't know whether there's any other question, but let me actually ask one. Yeah. The, in the discussion of your um, isobar results, and mm -hmm. you look at the ratio of many observables and trying to, and trying to adjust the geometry of the nuclear to, to fit data, right? Yeah. Including the thickness fluctuation or whatever. But do you actually imply this ratio for the same geometry is independent of the dy dynamics? Uh, no, no, I, I, I'm saying. Uh, for when... example, in, have you tried uh, using the same geometry, but changing the dynamics of the model yeah, yeah. Uh, so, right. So that I, so I that can, also change. Right. I, I understand. So in other words, you you're you're interested in, in let's see how it depends on viscosity, right? Uh, and these people have done this for the mean PT fluctuation. Sorry, mean PT. Um, we also did this in the MPT for the uh, for the V two for the how see how the flow, how the how the final state is in uh, sorry the the. Um, Final state uh, uh, transport coefficient influence the outer bar yeah. ratio for the V two and V three. I, I had the plot, the I made some plot. I don't have it here, um, and we do see some. There are some dependence. Okay, so what happens is that what is interesting is that if you change the eccentric, is, sorry, you change the shear viscosity by a let's say factor of three or factor four, right? You yeah. will not be able to describe the inclusive observable. Okay. So you cannot change it arbitrarily by a lot. So suppose you change your, your V2 by factor, by, let's say by, uh, by 50%, by varying the shear viscosity. What happens is that the also bar, so the V2 decreases suppose by 50%. We also saw the also bar ratio itself. Let's see, initially, let's see, it's a 2% signal. It may become 1.5%, okay? So in other words, um, the also bar ratio, the di difference from Y is depends on the transport coefficient and there is uncertainty, but the sensitivity I think is still better than the inclusive the observables. In other words, you still see the influence of, they will not disappear. It's just that you will see a very deep, you will see a, a, a sensitivity on that. And that's why I'm saying you could use R sub bar ratio itself to constrain the shear viscosity um, in a sense, right? Combined with the inclusive observer, but there is a dependence. There is a dependence. Yeah, okay. So in this case is uh, to use this kind of uh, observable to constrain nuclear shape uh, is uh, probably more complicated. Is uh, mm -hmm. have to probably in combination with other, you know, dynamical constraint together. Right, right. So, so first to, of all, to you reach to, certain precision, I'm, I'm what I'm saying. Yes, yes, yes. But, uh, but of course, uh, uh, you know, our initial model, we, we, without deformation, I don't claim our, our uh, Trento model or even the global model is, is, is precise, right? I mean, it's all, based <laughs> on, it's all based on this classical picture of a nucleons. And there's, it's not a really based on the nuclear structure input. And this is the, the I think it's about time to, for us to re-evaluate the, the, our initial assumption of global, right? Yeah. Because otherwise, uh, you know, we just say, okay, assuming global model is correct, here are the constraints on shear viscosity, okay? But do we know the global model, the, all those parameters are really precise, right? I, I, it's not clear to me. And, and, and thinking about the nuclear structure connection will probably allow us to really, you know, debate on this a bit further. Okay, so with that, uh, um, I'm not quite sure whether there are any other questions from the audience. If not, uh, well, let's thank Jia Yun again um, for, for your time and also this wonderful talk. Yeah. I hope um, we, we can continue this in your workshop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, uh, please register. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.